Frenchie to Tapway Talks, a midship kitchen party with Jamie Morse. Bonjour à Causerie Tapway, a party de cuisine avec Jamie Morse. Uh, la discussion aura lieu en anglais. Donc, pour les participants qui préfèrent écouter en français, nous offrons la traduction simultanée. En bas de votre écran Zoom, vous trouverez un bouton en forme de globe. Cliquez le bouton et vous entendrez la belle voix de nos interprètes. You will also find a button to activate closed captioning. Now, I can't guarantee the accuracy of it, but it might offer occasional good laughs. Um, I do want to mention, though, that it does misspell a number of words and names, so please double check those if you're looking to use them as references later on. Um, I'm Marianne Muller, your MC and co-host for Tapway Talks. Um, you can expect a free-flowing conversation with artists, and we would love to hear from you. At the bottom of your screen, you will find an icon for question and answers. We encourage you to add your questions in there as the discussion progresses, and we'll try to answer them as we go. Or if you're going off topic, we might get to your question at the end of the conversation. So who am I? I'm an interpreter uh, at Interpreter Guide at the National Gallery of Canada. I'm Métis from the Red River Valley in Treaty Number no. 1, now known as Manitoba. And so I'm a guest to the Ottawa region, as is the National Gallery, and we recognize that we stand on the unceded and unsurrendered territory of the Anishinaabe Algonquin nations. Their culture and presence have nurtured and continue to nurture the land. And they are the keepers and defenders of the Kitchissippi, the Ottawa River watershed. I honor their long history of welcoming many nations to this beautiful territory, and that I am a guest to the Omami Wininiwag. As a guest, I'm committed to defend and promote the voice and values of my host nation. Now, the media hasn't been doing a good job at keeping up with the number of uh, recovered unmarked graves sites on uh, residential school grounds, but I do want to take a moment to point uh, to the fact that we're at well over 2,000 sites now. There's also the question about um, hearing the expression land back these days. And these two topics, along with the land acknowledgement, all refer back to the land. And today we want to recognize that International Day of the World's Indigenous People is on Monday. And the theme this year is leaving no one behind, Indigenous peoples and the call for a new social contract. So what does land and uh, have to do with leaving no one behind? Well, we're people of the land and accessing, having access to it and the rights to its stewardship is what allows us to come together and ensure our well-being. It can provide us with food sovereignty and it can connect us to our culture and find our pride in it. Our homeland is where we come together. Regardless of your nation or where you are in the world, we connect to the land that is Mother Earth. So today we are going to touch on that. We'll talk about our connection to the land. And to do that, I would like to welcome Dr. Nicole Blackwood, who is Métis with Ukrainian heritage on her maternal side. She is a professor of art history at the Savannah College of Art and Design. She earned an MA and a PhD in the history of art and from London's Courtauld uh, Institute of Art and has taught at several universities in North America. She's held fellowships at Harvard, Yale, and the University of Toronto, and has worked with collections in museums in Canada, England, and in the United States. She's passionate about sharing the history of art with broad audiences through her teaching, writing, and public lectures. Though currently living in the United States on what is Yamacra territory, she is a member of the Métis Nation of Alberta uh, and was raised in Treaty 7. And she's joining us from North Carolina. Hello, Nicole. Hello, thank you, Ariane. Thank you. Um, and then joining us from Australia, we have Danny Meller, who is a contemporary Najanji rainforest people artist, whose multidisciplinary practice explores the intersection of contemporary and historic culture. And considering Australia's recent and ancient past, his work traverses the breadth of the narratives in relation to global art histories. Danny's reevaluation of iconic landscape tradition is informed by his connection to place through to place through Aboriginal heritage and ongoing preoccupation with Australia's landscape. Danny's work is held in regional, state, and national collections and international museums, including uh, here at the National Gallery of Canada, the British Museum, the National Museum of Scotland. He's also won a number of awards um, and has previously held positions of lecturer and senior lecturer at the National Institute of the Arts, ANU, and Sydney. 
College of the Arts. Um, Danny is joining us from Borel uh, near Sydney in Australia. Hello, Danny. Hi, Ariane. Thanks for that introduction. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. Finally, um, our final guest, Karen Joyner, is at you with Greek and Irish ancestry on her paternal side. She lives on unceded Algonquin territory in urban Ottawa, but her heart lives in her family's traditional territory of Iuistu along the coast of James Bay in northern Quebec. Karen is a proud auntie who is constantly inspired by her nieces and nephews as they grow up speaking East Cree, the language that she wishes to reclaim in her future. She's also a communication professional and photographer. Karen recently joined the gallery as a web writer in the spring of 2021. Prior to this, she worked as communications with the Assembly of First Nations and RCMP National Headquarters. She's driven to contribute her communications expertise that reflect Indigenous Indigenous narratives, combats ignorance, and advocates for Indigenous people across Turtle Island. And of course, hello, Karen. Miigwech. <laughs> and of course, you all know our host, my colleague and friend, Jamie Morris, an educator at the National Gallery of Canada. Jamie is the reason we come together around our virtual kitchen table, sip on some tea, and chat about topics that are near and dear to us. Thank you, Jamie, for once again, inviting us to your virtual table. Yay. Yay. Thanks, Ariane. Good. Pleasure. Yeah, so you're all good with the introductions? That was awesome. <laughs> I wanted to explain, it was always good. Okay, that's, why, that's why you do the introductions and not me, because you're way better at it. But I just wanted to say that this idea came together because ever since I moved to Ottawa, where I'm situated, I'm living um, on Anishinaabe Algonquin territory, there's always been a convergence of artists and politicians and business people and friends and family, um, different nations for different things that would come to Ottawa because it's the nation's capital. And it's always been more importantly, an international zone. So I, I kind of like took on this, Métis embassy idea, you know, several years ago, and I always had people kind of coming in and out of my house and some amazing conversations would pop up out of those um, interactions. And so Tapway in the Tapway talks means truth. So, and, and we talk about a number of different things. We let the conversation kind of flow as needed. And uh, for those of you who this isn't your first Tapway talks, you'll know that we just never know what direction the conversation is going to go in. We do have ideas and topics that we can try to, you know, stick to, but we ask each other questions. And um, I literally ran out of tea this morning. So I'm going to be on my, on my best without tea. So <laughs> I usually always have tea. Um, and, you know, that's part of the visit as well. So I, I just want to acknowledge as well my time on Anishinaabe territory. I've been here for since 2000 um, and I've been working at the gallery since 2012 and I wanted to kind of use that as an introduction to place myself with how I know all of the um, people at the table today so um, in 2012 was uh, Sagahan and uh, Danny Miller had um, some a beautiful uh, piece that we still have up right now I think in our galleries um, and it it was uh, a part of the International Indigenous Art Exhibition. Um, and I'm pretty sure it was the biggest and first one, but I, I, I'm i pretty sure. And so I met a lot of artists um, outside of North America for the first time who were Indigenous. And um, Danny's piece was really one that spoke to me in terms of like, uh, just relationship to the land and kind of like being crossed out sometimes of uh, imagery in that relationship. So, so that's how that's how I met Danny and got to know uh, Danny's work through the gallery. Um, and yeah, am I frozen? No. Okay, good. Just wanted to check. <laughs> so, um, and then I met uh, Karen recently. She became a part of you know our, our team at the gallery. So uh, that was really an important. Um, kind of uh, relationship to make. So Ariane, you're like digitizing <laughs> back and forth. Is everything okay? 
I'm, I'm, oh, I'm there, having, she's good. Okay. It's I'm okay. having to use hotspot on my phone. The gallery's uh, public oh, network okay. isn't strong enough. Not in my office, that right now. It's no. like all cement. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so basically, that's what we're going to do today is just kind of talk about, um, you know, how our, our relationship is to basically the land, but just the conversation's open. And for Nicole, um, this. I'm sure this has happened to everybody before, but you just kind of like meet someone on social media and you're like, I must include you in my life. <laughs> so <laughs> this was how I met Nicole. And um, I don't even remember the point of contact, but realizing that there's a, a Métis, a Machif person, you know, in the, U in the U.S., working in the field of arts and as an educator, I like my heart is full for you uh, all to be here today. So um, I guess I'll start off with kind of just talking about um, the World International Indigenous Day. So that's something that we, we like to try to uh, pick up on because, um, you know, more and more, I think that we're trying to include more voices, Indigenous voices from around the world. And we're all like, needing to learn about each other and our relationships to each other and um, I find art just like a great way to do that so um before we get into like I don't know well here's I guess we're getting into the meat of stuff now I want to show you a picture of where I'm from um in northern Alberta so I'm a chif uh Cree Métis um, and the difference is Métis is a French kind of word it's in the constitution um but like the machif, the word machif is our language. So we speak machif, we are machif. Um, I tend to use machif more because Métis can be confusing now to people. Um, and so uh, I wanted to show you, I'm gonna share my, my screen about like where my, my territory is. Um, but I don't know where to find that right now. So maybe um, I'll, maybe I'll just like, pass it on to um how about how about you Karen are you ready to show pictures or talk about a talk about or just have a sip of tea at this table and see what comes out of your face ah. sure. <laughs> sure I can I can start I actually um yeah first of all miigwech for having me on here this is really great it's nice to be in company with uh, with all of you I had a conversation this morning about um, one of the traditions in, in my territory. So I'm from, um, my family, most of my family lives in Chassassabie, um, Quebec, which is up in EOSG, which is 20 hours driving from uh, Ottawa. So it's pretty north. Long way. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, and one of the most beautiful um, parts of the culture that I was able to be a part of was a walking out ceremony, which is what I'm going to show you guys pictures of. So um, after I left photo school, um, it was in 2010, my firstborn niece um, had a walking out ceremony. So what that is, is um, my sister and her spouse did not let uh, my niece Scarlett um, see and interact with the outside world. So and not even touch the ground with her feet. So for a whole year, mm -hmm. she was kind of um, closed off to the outside, to Mother Earth. And what happens is on the event of their first birthday, there's a ceremony called walking out ceremony where we gather um, family and friends and there's a teepee that's set up. There's a feast that's kind of planned for it. And um, my sister would accompany um, her daughter out onto the land for the very first time. So the relationship to the land for um, EU people from up north, if that's been a tradition that's been going on for a long time. Um, unfortunately, um, my siblings and I and my cousin, we um, never had the opportunity to do that because of the impacts of residential school. My grandparents are residential school survivors, so they didn't carry on the culture. So it kind of skipped a couple of generations, um, but they were totally involved in um, this walking, these walking out ceremonies for their three great grandchildren. And it's just so beautiful to, you know, see that being reclaimed and see that being like revitalized. And um, it was just nice to have them involved in that and to see that happen in their, in their lifetime. So um, I took 
I have four pictures to share. So I have a friend actually who lives in Ottawa and she did the same with her with her son and like trying to do that in Ottawa and for a whole oh, year, yeah. like in an urban center and she did it. And she's That's also awesome. clean, so it's really beautiful. Yeah. Wow. So this is, so it's usually, it starts very early in the morning. So I, for a couple of them, I think I remember waking up at like four or five in the morning, which is nothing for Danny right now. He's up at like 3 a.m. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> But yeah, super early and um, they would set up a teepee and there's a kind of like a stack of firewood as firewood as you can see right here. That's where they would walk around. So this is just kind of showing the scale of the teepee and the sunrise and behind these trees, um, there's actually a big river and that's what the, the community's name is. It, it actually translates to big river. So you could hear the, you know, the water in the background and it was kind of windy. It was kind of, I think it was gonna rain that day, but it was beautiful. So that's just uh, the beginning when I got there. And then, oh, I, I can't, oh, okay, yeah. So this is her and uh, my, my niece Scarlett coming out of the teepee for the first time. So they're dressed in, um, you know, traditional wear. Um, she had little tools around her. Yeah. Oh, that's cute. Yeah. They pack a little, a little mini thing of firewood and fire, firewood in the back of her uh, back there, and she's holding a little axe. Uh, mm -hmm. It's very cute. And then she has gifts for her her great grandparents. So when they come back in, they give gifts. Aww. So that's the second picture. And you can oh, just God, see. I, I like this, this picture because there's those are her um, her family. <laughs> I'm excited for so happy yeah, it's so, such a joyful yeah. um you know rite of passage for for little ones and everyone's very excited and happy and then this was just the last picture here portrait of her and her daughter and scarlet is now she just turned 10 so and she's done this my sister's done this for all three of her children and um yeah it's just a really beautiful tradition and it kind of shows it kind of you know it, set, it sets the bar for your relationship with the land um as a young person so mm -hmm. even the look on scarlet's face coming out of the teepee you could tell it was just she was overwhelmed with the beauty around her mm -hmm. and uh yeah those are the most oh, powerful wow. events that i was able to photograph so i'm really happy to share this and, and share that tradition with you guys <laughs> oh they're beautiful thank you for sharing that anybody else's <laughs> eyes are tearing up because I know. <laughs> like, it's, a little sting it's so beautiful it's absolutely beautiful like I'm, yeah I'm in awe about that yeah well thanks thanks so much Karen um Danny I know you had a few pictures you were like the start of this you're like can I show these pictures and I'm like oh my god copyright so then I had to go and then they're just like personal <laughs> so these are some of the issues of working at the National Gallery but we found a way to I show understand. pictures of our own yeah so yeah. I'd love to see yours sure well thank you for that slideshow as well that's pretty special to mm -hmm. see those images and I, I should add while I'm talking now that I'm I'm coming to you from a a place in the Southern Highlands near Sydney. Um, it's, on, it's on Gundungara country. That's the name of the local people here. But I'll show you some pictures from up in the rainforest of North Queensland. This is the area of um, Ndjongji people, um, which is from where my family come, from a particular place called the Atherton Tablelands. And um, a, a couple of images that I'll show, I'll talk through them and it'll give you an, a, a sense of the uh, the landscape up there. So just to give you a sense of geography, this is where I am in the green spot. I'm broadcasting to you from there. And if you look up to the north of Australia, that red dot is where we're going to go with a few images. So um, we were talking about long drives before. That drive there is about 27 to 30 hour drive. So it's a fair few miles. So it's quite cold where I am, but nice and warm up the top. So these are images of the um, of the wow. rainforest around that wow. area. It's um, it's a really special place. It's it was once volcanic. Um, there are areas of Gond Gondwana rainforest which are several hundreds of millions of years old that have been in place. So when you walk through these environments and those ecologies, there's a real sense that you're walking. Um, in amongst an incredibly ancient 
and almost primordial sort of space, it's really quite, it's overwhelming in many, in many, many ways. And it's so, so rich in life. Everything's very green and very humid. Um, so this is um, an area that is a, a place in, it's just a little bit south where I, oh, my, my family gorgeous. comes from, but I'm close with a family down there. This is wow. Didabal country. So it's a very important, significant site, as, as we all know, the uh, special significant sites in every piece of country. But this is where um, a story of a man, a, a, a legend of a mythical man called Gidigara, um, he walked through this area and he was very important because he, he gave language um, to rainforest people and basically the world. So he gave names in language for pretty much everything under the sun and moon. And this is one of the areas that he walked through. Wow. Um, there are really quite amazing kinds of, um, as I say, these prehistoric animals. This is Gundoy, and that's the language word for cassowary. And this is an incredible sort of bird that roams in the rainforest. So I was very lucky to get this shot. They're quite shy. Um, but looking there, and the one that on the right is, I also shoot in infrared. So I'm very interested in my work in how we translate the visible world or the landscape into a conversation around culture and ancestral presence. And infrared ph photography I've found has been a really useful kind of way of talking about things that are unseen being made visible. So just because things are not immediately within the visible light spectrum, doesn't mean they're not there. So when you talk about that visibility of infrared, you can then talk about how those spaces in landscape are spiritually significant. And there's a, a whole sort of narrative and understanding and connection to those spaces, which is subtle and often intangible perhaps. So that's been sort of one of the strands of my work over the last few years. And um, oh yeah, it's very important to look up in the rainforest, there are beautiful sort of canopies. Oh, they look like flowers almost. Oh, yeah, they're incredible leaves. Yeah. They're quite large. They're very high up. Mm -hmm. But you get this really atmospheric, just phenomenal sort of, it's another landscape in a sense. It's a skyscape. It's so beautiful. It's so beautiful. Yeah, it, it's, it's really just incredible. And so this is a, a work that I thought I would um, show you as well. It's, a, it's around about a 13 metre um, infrared landscape. Um, so and it, this is one of those things that I thought would be quite important to kind of do and to talk about that idea of connection to land and space, but also to look at how Aboriginal people are very much part of that landscape and, and live in that, um, I guess, that environment and have been there for so many thousands of years. So this, in a sense, was a really powerful way, I thought, as a tool of photography. For, to refer not just to those histories of late colonial photography that are part of, um, you know, your cultures and our cultures over here, um, but then to begin to address the power of imagery and how infrared or, or photography can take us through into other worlds and begin to appreciate those sorts of intangible unseen things. Mm -hmm. Speaking of There's... intangible unseen things, that I don't know why this is, it reminded me this was like on a, on a minuscule level I was I was on a meeting and I felt this like little bite and it was a tiny little red bug but I could not find it but I knew it was there and I was just like I found it but I feel like using you know because you, you talked about infrared and that's kind of like how my mind works and the unseen and red I picked up on that <laughs> so but I think it's I think it's true. I, and, and like I said, I was completely connected because my grandma had all these blue willow pattern plates yeah, right. and yeah. brown ones. And there's like no animals in them and no people. And I was just like, I know this. I get this. Yeah. It's a yeah, lot. Just take it from the land. Yeah. yeah. There was one of the picture that you showed us with the river. If it wasn't for the palm trees, you would have thought that it could have been taken over here on Turtle Island just because the way the river flowed, the rocks that were there, the leaves, everything mm -hmm. looked, it looked so familiar for me, even though I've unfortunately never set foot in Australia. Well, there's rainforest in BC, you know, I think it's, about that too. Yeah. And there's not probably anything as like, I don't know if they're, I've never been to Australia, um, but I wonder if they're bigger. Have you been to BC, Danny? 
Have you seen two? No, have you seen I, the... I, know, I haven't, but I know the rainforests that you're speaking about. I've seen images of them. They're really quite haunting and mm -hmm. absolutely stunning. Yeah. 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 They have a lot of like green moss and stuff. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. yeah. So. And they also hold a lot of significance to the indigenous people from the area. So there's that yeah. connection that we see around the world where we often find ourselves connecting to the land and having that the land being a point of spirituality, I suppose. And, it, and yeah. it also makes for like diversity in terms of like the most diversity of indigenous people in Canada is BC. And it's because of the rainforest and the mountains and the ocean and the desert and um, you know, just that's really interesting. In the in the area up around there in the Atherton Tablelands, and that's up around Cairns, mm -hmm. there are, I think, around twelve to fifteen different language groups, and so that that ecology, you know, with all the subdivisions of clans and so on, and those that ecology is so abundant and um, can support that level of population and that diversity, as you're saying, is the same as, as British Columbia from what I'm what I'm hearing. Yeah. And it's really, it's really quite amazing to then understand that from you know over a three or four hour road trip, you've passed through so many different people's countries and homes. It's yeah. really it's a, an amazing thing to experience and be part of. Speaking mm -hmm. of traveling and going through places, Nicole. You're also traveling a little bit right now. In transit. <laughs> In Just transit. Typical, typical of a Métis person. <laughs> yes, I feel at some awesome. level sort of always in transit. Um, mm -hmm. It's because it's in your blood. It's in your heart. And that's why it's okay. <laughs> Did you have happen to have any pictures to show us of your... Yeah. Yes, I do. So I just want to say thank you so much for inviting me. I, I feel um, listening to your stories, Karen and Danny, it's this kind of um, moment of both discovery and capturing that I think you're both sort of speaking to. And I think that's something that I've been in a kind of um, process of as well. So I was um, first generation to be born in Calgary and was raised in this urban environment. So somewhat sort of disconnected uh, from the landscape in some way or form, but many of my maternal and paternal ancestors uh, had lived in the region of what became known as Alberta since really the early 1800s. Um, and they settled there from come, arriving first from Quebec, uh, from the Red River Settlement, from Galatia, and from Assiniboia, which um, became Saskatchewan. So a lot of sort of movement in that, in that history. And the story of why they ended up in Alberta was not always really known to me. And so as a historian, I've really spent the past few years trying to unravel and sort of um, piece those those uh, moments together. Uh, mm -hmm. And part of that discovery, I think, is what has kept me connected to that place, even though I haven't lived in Alberta for more than 20 years. So I've been in some ways displaced from that sort of originating birthplace. Mm -hmm. um, but when I think, as you say, Jamie, back to the history of the Métis people, there's always been something of a kind of nomadic culture to it. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes my ancestors stayed only a season in a place, sometimes yeah. one or two generations. Um, sometimes they left freely in order to seek new opportunities. Sometimes they were forcibly removed. And I think it's that sort of intergenerational trauma um, and internalized racism of displacement um, from the Red River in the 1870s that caused a certain fracture of that paternal story that I'm sort of seeking to recover. Um, and it's, it's, it's sort of amazing to think how easy those narratives are, how, how easily they're lost, um, yeah. muddled in sort of miscommunication, um, sometimes unfortunate premature deaths, um, shame, internalized colonialism, and it's really a process of rediscovery at some level. So um, that has been my journey, and it's made a little bit more challenging the past two years with COVID. So I haven't been able to return home that frequently, and really this um, 
think it was about three weeks, two weeks ago now, I was able to go home for the first time in over two years. And it was a real sort of moment of rediscovery. So one of the things that I did there uh, was visit with my uncle and he took me um, through some photographs. So I wanted to share one of those photographs with you that he shared with me of my paternal, um, uh, let me see. I love here. that you went with your uncle. I just, that was my kind of intro too, my dad and my uncle. Yeah, it's your handsome family. So this is my uh, great grandfather uh, and this is him uh, here uh, sort of next to this sow, which is in a uh, medicine hat. And I think when we think about home, part of it is um, those relationships. So for me, it's not just simply a document yeah. a photograph of my paternal great grandfather, but actually the sharing of that through my uncle. So for that, I'm, I'm very grateful. And then another side of this is, is connected, of course, to the land. And one of the things that I was fortunate to do in this, in this trip back to Alberta was uh, visit Jasper House with my father. So we went to Jasper House, which is also a place where my Métis ancestors traded in the 19th century. And although Jasper House, the physical structure of Jasper House is no longer there, you can get a sense of the landscape. And just standing there with my father, um, speaking the names of our ancestors as the river flowed against this backdrop of the sort of solidity of the mountains was a way of sort of honoring those uh, ancestors, but also of returning home. I think when you go to a place you know your ancestors have been, there's a, there's a, there's a spirit there. Um, and it's, it's an important process of recalling that, that memory. And so that cultural memory, that place memory is uh, a matter of really profound importance for everyone, indigenous, uh, I think non-indigenous, um, and how you go about recovering it, I think, is one of sort of activation and animation yeah. of actually traveling and so mm -hmm. um, and moving in the spaces um, where they once were. So that's sort of some of the things I wanted to share. I love what you said about the activation because it, it's so true. And we've done even a couple of artworks at the gallery that require activation. Mm -hmm. for their full potential to be reached right so we have mm -hmm. like the maker space with your nango and um the storytelling element is so connected to the land and and that's that's the i love that's the activation of the land too you know it, it activates itself in many different ways but our human connection is often through those stories and i and i think also an immersion um and that's what yeah. i think danny's work also really speaks to is that sense of a kind of the multiple panels and the immersive experience of, of experiencing it on a, a larger scale. Yeah. Nicole, can I ask, with that mountain that's around about two thirds along the photograph to the right, mm -hmm. what, do you know the name of that mountain? What's, that, what's the landscape here? This is in Jasper, Alberta. So this is along the Athabasca River. I don't know the specific name of that mountain. I wish I did, um, but. Is that like the, yeah. the middle mountain kind of? Is that, yeah. This one here? No, it's over on the right. It's yeah, that quite extraordinary. Oh. I, I, I'll, I'm going to look at Google Earth after this. This is a phenomenal landscape. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, Jenny, next time you come back to Canada, you've got to go to Jasper and Banff and there's lots of places to check out. But yeah. I, I, when I was in Ottawa, I, I really enjoyed that time there. But of course, it, it, you always feel that there's, there's more to see. Absolutely. And, there, and like it's just too, right outside the city, some of it too. And I can't, when artists come in, we don't always have enough time to go there. And yeah, yeah so. That was, it was jam-packed scheduled. So it, it, was, it was a great time. But yeah, you yeah. have the sense that there's, there's a lot and people who were there as well had a lot that they wanted to share. And yeah. can, I felt uh, frustrated in a really good sort of way. Yeah. Knowing the that, knowing that there, is, there is actually, there would be this incredible hospitality. And if you were able to make a journey, it would be a phenomenal sort of experience. Yeah, absolutely. So Ariane, do you want to show your photos? Because um, like, I think one important thing about what Nicole was saying too, is that 
you know, so my Métis experience doesn't include mountains. Um, Ariane's ex Métis experience includes much more French. Um, my, you know, my Métis experience is really close to the Cree experience, actually, the, the, because, you know, we're on the border of tr Treaty, um, like, 6 and Treaty 8. So, actually, where I'm from, it's, I'll show you guys after, but um, it can be hard to pin down, like, the one land location as a Métis person because it's changed so much and our relationship with different First Nations um, in their territories have changed as well. And so, I, so it's not always an easy story to tell as a Métis person connected to the land. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm from Manitoba, small town. Um, and so prairies, right? It's flat, flat, flat. Um, unfortunately, I can't, couldn't find the picture I want or the picture I wanted to share. So I settled for the second best. And unfortunately, the second best wasn't so great either. So I'm going with third best here. Um, so this is a picture that I um, from a couple of years ago. There are, I think, a total of 11 bald eagles in this picture. Uh oh. Um, so this is on the roadside. Um, you can see there's still some ice, so it's thawing. It's spring. Um, the fields aren't golden yet. Um, they have haven't been taken over by the planting of the farmers which that in itself you know you kind of think about about the removal of what was there to replace it with something else and every spring you see this land devoid of life where you know that historically it would have been beaming with life there would have been so 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 much to see um and my family also moved we, um, from Manitoba. Uh, we went over to Isle of Cross where one of my ancestors married, um, Catherine uh, Lacerte. And, um, and then they moved back to Manitoba, but they were in Isle of Cross for a period of time. And um, the, her husband, uh, was actually a uh, mailman. So he did a lot of traveling in the area. Um, but yeah, I think this year actually, or last year, I should say, I was hoping to do a bit of a pilgrimage. Words are becoming hard to say. I, I was hoping to do a pil pilgrimage towards Isla Cross and actually go see some of this land that you know, my family would have lived on historically and connect with the culture in a different way because after moving away from there, um, though it was historically um, Francophone speaking, and I think Anishinaabe Moen, um, and I'm not even sure about that, um, they then moved to Manitoba. Um, so, it's just a question of reconnecting with the culture, reconnecting with the people that were from there and finding those roots again. So it's unfortunate that I wasn't able to do that because COVID happened. And COVID has had a huge impact on just being able to go visit home for so many of us. I haven't been able to go back since 2018 or 2019, I should say. It's, you know, it's been a long time that I've had my feet on my land. And that creates a little bit of a disconnect, I find, uh, kind of like a detachment. And right now, I think as COVID subsides, maybe, hopefully, um, a lot of us are going to be looking to reconnect with our land, our homes, our, where we're from. I think okay. it's been quite a common sort of story. At the moment in Australia, one third of the country is under lockdown. And almost the, almost the whole of the eastern seaboard is um, under some sort of restriction. So the capital centres are locked down. Um, in regional areas, um, there are really quite strong restrictions. There's no, there's no travel between states. And so in that sense, where you face that sort of those obstacles of travel, um, same here has been one of those things as well. And it, um, we're always sort of careful as well because if you travel from somewhere else to um, community, 
there's always the risk of transmission. And mm-hmm. you know, some of the Aboriginal, old Aboriginal people are certainly more susceptible. In the remote communities in Australia, they actually created biospheres where there was um, literally, there were very non-porous kinds of um, boundaries and limitations placed on community interaction. Um, there was no visitors that were able to go to those communities. Um, and so it's been very carefully played in Australia that we can't leave the country. We don't actually have permission. You need a very good reason to leave yeah. the country. And it's very I difficult to I, actually get back into the country. A, a kitchen table talk, is that a good reason to leave the country or no? <laughs> well, <laughs> via Zoom, yes. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hear you. Yeah. I'm here. I hear you, Ariane and, and Denny, on, on being kind of restricted over the past couple of years. Um, it's weird. I mean, I'm thankful that like technology exists, but I have not hugged my nieces and my nephew in so long. And uh, I was just able to reconnect with my brother um, last weekend. And like, he's just describing how tall, like my niece is almost as tall as me. And, you know, just time flies, time flies. And over the past couple of years, it's going to be, it'll be a really sweet um, reunion for a lot of people to, yeah. to reconnect with their family members that are, are far away, for sure. And, you know, and the other thing, just to add to what Danny was saying, one of the restrictions that I've felt, I've really wanted to go home. I, my dad's, you know, begging me to come home. I've never seen our berry patch. Um, <laughs> you know, every family has a berry patch. And I was really looking t- forward to finding it this year um with him but uh some yeah the vaccination rates are are not huge either and so it does um kind of you know affect my my travel when it's it's family and people that you know who aren't Mm -hmm. Um, and then you know the fourth wave and stuff so it's it's really yeah it does affect it has affected our relationship with the land i think and and traveling to some extent yeah so thanks, Ariane. Um, I found I found how to share. So do you guys want to see where I'm from? Yeah. yeah. Okay. For sure. Let's see. So I didn't do like I didn't do all global like Danny did, but <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was a great idea. I'm just like, yeah, because that's you know how our world is. It's round. And, but this is Canada. So I just in the context of Canada, you can see where Fort McMurray is. Can you guys see my slide? Yep. Okay, good. So it's in between like Edmonton and Fort McMurray. And that's like where the Treaty 6, Treaty 8 and Treaty 10 all converge. And I I think I was confused forever about what treaty I belong to because like literally they converge in that one spot. So in Alberta, um, this is where I grew up on the green dot place called Lac La Biche. This is what it looks like from an aerial point of view. So it's, it's right up on the lake. And this is not an indigenous town per se. This is a, a mixed town of um, French, English, Cree, Dene, Métis, Lebanese, uh, and Filipino. So it's a very diverse community in Northern Alberta. Um, yeah, so that's just like the main drag uh, of town. I've done thousands of laps on that street. And um, this is a, my picture of my grandma. She's a fisher person. <laughs> I mean, that's one name for her, but she was so many other awesome things. But in the back is the mission. And this is the old kind of like technology, Métis technology, the York kind of ideas of the York boat. So they're very different than other fisher people in the area. Um, so she, so that's my dad's mom. And here are all the settlements. A lot of maps. This is all still context for you guys. <laughs> Lac La is here. My dad lives here. It's a, a Métis community called Buffalo Lake Métis Settlement, and there are eight in the province. And this is also our kind of territory. This is Lac La Biche. This is my dad and his brothers. And this is where um, like our land is. So this is called a historic site, and the Oblates um, uh, kind of started this mission and the HBC was the Hudson Bay Company was very prominent in our area. Uh, so um, what you're looking at is actually where our community is about to do one of our ground searches. Um, 
so it hasn't been done yet. And for, I don't know if Nicole and Danny are um, aware, but we're doing, uh, there's a lot of um, ground searches that are happening at the sites of former residential schools, missions. This one's a mission, um, day schools and- um, I saw a recent interview on the BBC and I, I, I seem to remember the, the woman's name was, is it Roseanne Archibald? Yeah, that's the national new chat national chief. That's right. Yeah, she gave a very good interview and a really balanced overview. I thought, you know, for a very, really difficult and um, horrifically tragic subject, yeah. she spoke very well about it and gave a sense of insight and depth. And it's it has been an unfolding story that I've been aware of. It's been shown here for quite a few weeks now as it's happened. Yeah. So, I mean, I, th this, yeah, so it, 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 and I have seen like reports in BBC too, so that I always think like that's, you know, a global source that many people go to. Um, and so if I see stuff there, I'm like, okay, so people are getting to know this is happening around the world. And, um, you know, just where the, the church is on the other side of that church is a, um, I don't want to show any pictures of it, but it's a, um, an outline, like a cement outline of where the priest's house residence was. I forget what they're called, like, but um, there that's one site underneath the house of the priest that will be um, looked at. And yeah, this is where my dad went to residential school. And um, Métis people who went to missions, day schools, or boarding schools, so not residential schools, even though this was a residence, haven't been compensated or an apology has and yet we're ready to do this ground search where we're bringing bringing home our babies you know so um the numbers are are very very skewed because we we haven't included everybody and everything but um yeah so that's that's our our main territory called the mission and this is where my dad does his fishing on the lake so i wanted to not end on you know there's two there's 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 emotions attached to different parts of our territories and our lands now this is a good one because you know we're fishing and he's giving us traditional knowledge uh, and about how to set set uh, nets and stuff like that so i'm going to stop sharing um that's just the stuff i do with the fish scales after but that's not what i'm going to show so looks so nice yeah we had a question um earlier yes about, i saw that about land acknowledgement and how to make them more than lip service and well i think what we're doing here like i, I read that question and i was like it's such a good question because i'm trying to stop my presentation here guys um, <laughs> um so i think that what we're doing by by placing ourselves from our own communities and and lands is is one way to to kind of do a land acknowledgement uh, might need a quick I, I, I just can't oh there thank you Who, whoever did that <laughs> <laughs> um are there land acknowledgements um done anywhere else like we've got nicole and danny um like are they, they are, done they're, okay. they're part of and become more so part of um, the beginning of, of public functions, but also um, where there are private functions as well, if it's appropriate. And it's always an acknowledgement of traditional custodians of that particular area. So um, when I started off, I was talking about being in Barrow, it's Gundungara, but we call it, we call it country. So it's the well, country of the Gundungara people, but we refer to it as Gundungara country um, up around for where I'm from, depending which language group or which country you're on, that would be, you know, Jutabal or Mamu or Irukandji or Kuki Alanji, that sort of thing. So, and I, I was listening quite carefully to the way you were introducing the, the session as well. And um, it has much the same ring to it and, and sentiment. And in response to the person who asked the question, do it with feeling and with a sense of sincerity, I would say. Yeah, and, and relationality, that's my always, my thing is always like, how how are you related 
to where you are right now, you know, mm -hmm. so yeah, I like that you did that. So we have only 10 minutes, see how fast this goes. And like, we're just getting into getting to know each other and our territories. And now I have a new question for you. This one I ask all the guests at the end of our chat. If you were sent to the bush for an unknown period of time, I'm thinking like a year-ish. You don't really know though, so it's uncertain. And I would say bring your favorite, but it's not about favorite. It's about what would you bring for one book, one piece of art, and one piece of music for this unknown amount of time that you have to be able to read to read over and over and listen to over and over and look at over and over again. So I'm going to start, I'm going to start with, I'm going to start with Karen. <laughs> I knew it. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. I thought about, I thought about this and yeah. So if I was sent to the bush for a year, um, I, I've been talking, my brother's very like influential on my life with my, with what I'm reading, with what I'm listening to. And a lot of it's kind of inspired by him. Um, but he's been, he's been bugging me for a while to read five little Indians by Michelle Good. I oh, haven't, yes. I have not started it yet, but, um, I'm, I'm the type of person that needs to read one book at a time. So I'd take that with me. And for music, um, I would probably take, um, any of the albums by my favorite band Fleet Foxes, which was also inspired by my brother. He got me really into them. What are they called Fleet Foxes? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Cool. They're kind of like a like a folk band, but they're really good. Nice. I nice. saw them uh, I saw them twice with my brother. And for for art, there's so if I need to bring an, an artist artist's work, um <laughs> because I was thinking about this. If I were sent to the bush and I were just to practice art, I would bring like a bunch of beads because I've been beading a lot. A hood, bring um, a beaded hood. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, cool. yeah, for sure. Yeah, mm -hmm. but if I was to pick a an artist, I'm really, I really, really love Kent Monkman's work. I think that it's very, um, I mean, it's, it's interesting. I know what you want to look at for a year. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no. But it, just, it, ties in the, it ties in the true like history, like in an in indigenous lens. And I think that that's so necessary in this. And in something this we haven't seen for like, you know. Yeah. yeah. So everything that he does, I'm like, I, I'm really into it. And each little picture has like a whole big historic story about it. And I think that's what's fun about picking out, you know, little parts. Because you can look at that for a year and just... Yeah find things over and over. I love that. And also before I, I pass it on to the next person, your earrings. Tell us oh, about yes. your bling. <laughs> my earrings are made by my friend, Stephanie Pelche. So she's uh, in Ottawa and um, she goes by Delia Estelle Designs. She's super good. I buy earrings from her all the time and they're always like super nice and they're very lightweight, which is important because I don't want them too heavy. <laughs> and yeah. what about yours? Um, yeah, so this is part of the thing, this part of the thing, you guys, you just have to hang in there, Danny. Um, <laughs> I'm wearing Joy Arcan's a stem earring. So it just means in Cree, it means come here. And if it was a stem with day, it would be come here now, but it's just a stem. So, oh, wait, is it? I think it is. I yeah, just want to, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, good. Cause sometimes they say a was, which means go away. And that's a different sentiment. So. <laughs> one on one side and one on the other side yeah, yeah. turn so. the other cheek turn the other cheek so. yeah so what about turn the you, other your book your art well, your music and your earrings well my, my, I'll start with my earrings uh, my earrings are actually by a local artist group in Charleston and they're of grouse feathers um, so oh, I love that. They make really interesting sort of feathered um, bow ties and jewelry. Uh, but I think for your question, because it is my 14th wedding anniversary today, I think I'll have to just say, oh, okay, my husband. <laughs> He's going to provide you the book, the music, and the art. Exactly. <laughs> All of them. All of the above. 
Awesome. Anniversary. Okay. Yeah, that's a nice dedication for him. Thanks. Okay, now really, what book and what piece of art and what music? <laughs> <laughs> You're not getting away with this one. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, I just, you don't have to, you don't have to, but um, I love this part because I just, there's so many new books by Indigenous people, and your book might not be Indigenous, but I just love to, you know, promote uh, other Indigenous artists in different fields too, so it's sort of why we talk about this one, but I'll, Nicole, if you want to answer this, you still have a chance, but I'm going to go to, do you want to, are you ready? I'm just, I'm just, I've just started, I don't know if any of you have read it, but Braiding Sweetgrass. Mm. Yes. So I've, been, so I've just been starting that, which is really excellent. Yeah, super. Hey, Jenny, do you have your list? Do you have your thoughts around being well, pushed for you? I'm, I'm thinking on my feet because I didn't do my homework. <laughs> That's okay. It's not real homework. <laughs> I, the, the things that I would probably just take the things that I've been looking at now and I've been looking very closely at work by the, the Dusseldorf School of Photographers and you know that includes Andreas Gursky, uh, Thomas Struth, uh, um, Thomas Ruff. It's really quite interesting that there's this group of artists, one of whom Thomas Struth was taught by Gerhard Richter initially as a painter but I'm really interested in the way that they approach photography with that large format, mm -hmm. very sort of considered, really calculated. You, without stereotyping, it's, it's quite German, it's very precise. There's this real kind of um, considered seriousness weight to the photography. And, and I, in many ways, when I look at the architecture of that photography, I think about the architecture of the rainforest and how, well, Thomas Struth did a series um, of paradise pictures and he actually went to the Daintree rainforest in North Queensland and did pictures there. So there's a really sort of interesting parallel that I find in terms of the structure and the formality and mm -hmm. thinking about composition. So um, in a way that would have to double as my art and book um, in terms of music. I, I would have to just say, I would be taking my whole selection and just play whatever the mood grabs me. <laughs> and I would also, if I was going to make art, I'll definitely be taking my camera and iPad and a few other things and, and lots and lots of memory cards. Well, you're going on like a camping trip now. Yeah, I, <laughs> I think what I love what when our previous guest said they were going to bring a book on plants, on edible and non-edible plants. I'm like, I'm going to say that every time, every time I have a session. Because, <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's so many ideas that you could, I love, you know, being able to take that amount of time and just examine it for, you know, that's all you had. That was all of the input and inspiration outside of the, the bush around you. So, um, your earrings, did you want to make a comment about? No? Okay. Uh, well, I'm, I'm really left out on that one. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> no worries. Ariane, your turn. Oh, um, book. I'm going to cheat book and art here. I, I would actually take the. Everybody cheats acronym. during this game. It's I, know, I know. I <laughs> know. Is it cheating? It really? Um, I would take uh, the catalog, Abbott Aquinas uh, mm. catalog. Yeah. So then I would have a lot of pages of art to go through and look at. And what I love about it is obviously every time you look at things, you see it differently. And through your lived experiences, your ex perspective of the pieces of art changes. So I think it'd be interesting to take note of how I see things at the beginning and towards the middle and towards the end of my bush whacking yeah. <laughs> um the piece of art i'm gonna go with your nango's um sammy architectural library because i think it would nice. provide me with a little bit of a shelter as well so it's mm -hmm. a piece of art and shelter and there's a tv in it Ooh, and there's a tv, a TV. <laughs> <laughs> um what i like about it is also <laughs> the reminder of using what's available and what's accessible to build out your space, um, that you don't need everything new, that things are right there and available and ready to be used. So I think that is, would help inspire me as I stayed in the woods for an extended period of time. And music, um, I am going to plug our, the music that started the, yeah. uh, the tap we talk it was chris dirksen um the violin music that we heard at the beginning so i would take uh one of their records with me and actually that's whose music we had during the alex janvier exhibition at the gallery oh, cool. so yeah that's I really chris 
Mm -hmm. And your earrings. So did you oh, talk about your yeah. um prairie owl beads? I believe their name is. It's a group of three sisters. Um, <laughs> or two sisters and a cousin. Uh, they're Métis from Manitoba. And so the bees I ordered from them. They suit ago. you perfectly. Thank you. Yeah. Dirksen, yeah, Chris Dirksen. I just put it in the, on the side. So, wow, that's two o'clock, but I'm gonna like, I'm gonna squish in um, my music. I've been really into Snotty Nose Res Kids lately. Yeah. Bougie Native. Yeah. I'm just like, I'm into the Bougie Native song. <laughs> I'm just gonna like rock up on myself inside of well I like your idea about your Nango but I was also thinking about um remember Elaine Luluan uh her mm. piece that was like the big white kind of covering and it just reminded me of like I don't know like motherly comfort so I think I would bring that as my security artwork <laughs> and a book I'm terrible with um, I'm, I, I read, but I like, I like listening to audiobooks. So I'm, I'm also going to cheat at my own game and bring, <laughs> oh gosh, um, I'm going to bring a poet, uh, an audiobook. And, um, she's from the U S Nicole and very famous. And I'm just going to look at my audiobooks now in case you can't remember or think about who I'm talking about. So <laughs> that's a big open-ended yeah. <laughs> there's just a few uh poets in the u.s no no but she's like a pulitzer prize winner and like and and like totally i'm not gonna i'm not gonna end this until i find her name <laughs> <laughs> i promise yeah, you can't. um so her name you know okay joy harjo joy harjo so that's whose poetry I would bring through audio version because just completely inspiring. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. So, okay. So thank you, everyone. Um, I'm going to go try to find my cup of tea now somewhere else outside of my tea-less house. <laughs> but I just wanted to, yeah, just say thank you so much. It's been really fun. I love seeing the photos, love hearing about where you're from and just the, you know, general dialogue that we never knew where it was going to go. And it just works out like that. So hi, hi, Eximaga, Kinanaskomitin. Until the next time, we'll see you again. Thanks, Jamie. Great yeah, to see you. Take care, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.